I'm ready. All right, that was a weak clap. Everybody just put your hands together fast. Like, just put them together. That's you call that clapping. You put them together like that, you call that clapping. Good. Excellent. Let's go through our declarations. If you're visiting with us, we begin every teaching. Glory to God, I feel the anointing. Hallelujah. We begin every teaching by giving you seven declarations, seven points from the previous week. That's how we begin every single week because we believe that acquiring the Word of God, assimilating, growing in the Word of God is a cumulative process. You don't hear something this week that cancels what you heard last week. You build upon what you would have heard the week before. Say amen to that. All right, so let's start building this and get ready for where we're going. Number one, I want you to get from last week. Number one is this, I will always sanctify Jesus as the Son of God. Read that, ready, read. That is important in 2019 because in 2019, Jesus is under a lot of pressure. People ain't on Jesus run no more. We're making Jesus another prophet. Some people making him totally irrelevant. This whole idea of Jesus, we're making him a creation of the white man, a, a, a figment of our imagination. I can't believe you so smart to believe that Christian foolishness about that Jesus stuff. And in this hour where there is such questioning of Jesus, I believe that we are back 2,000 years ago. Because back then there was this question about Jesus. And now here we are today in that same kind of environment, that same culture. And what is important is that those of us that do the church thing, it's crazy for you to come to church every Sunday and can't defend your Jesus. It doesn't make sense that you call yourself a believer, you call yourself a Christian, Jesus Christ, Christian, you call yourself a Christian, and you cannot create a defense for what you believe. Mm. Mm. If you find yourself with a, a Baha'i or with a Muslim or with a atheist, can you present a Jesus argument? Can you? It's a serious question for us to look at. Because if you meet a 12-year-old Muslim, he will be able to support what he believes. Hmm. But you can meet a 50-year-old Christian who could tell you how good their pastors preach, but can't say nothing about the Jesus they believe in. Can you give me five Jesus scriptures? Preach, Rev. Five, five, five. Close your Bible and give me five Jesus scriptures. I get one. Jesus Rev. <laughs> Can you present a case as to why? Because if you, you realize, though, I don't know if you realize this, if you take Jesus out of this picture, we ain't got nothing, you know. Do, do you realize that? You could get rid of the three wise men. They're cool. We don't need them. Because I don't think it's treat them no how. You could get rid of the 12 disciples. Because we don't know you can trust them. You could get rid of, I mean, you could all those, you could even get rid of the Bible. Yes, you can. But what you cannot do, you can't get rid of Jesus. If you lose Jesus, you don't get nothing else. But pastor, what you think about Yeshua? I don't know what you think about him. That's Jesus? Yeah, you're calling the wrong name. Okay, that's Jesus. I cool with him. But you've got to know you cannot be a believer, you cannot be a Christian, and cannot support to some extent. You, I'm actually to be a theologian, but as a believer, you should be able to see something or say something about Jesus. And if that fails, then you should have some sort of personal experience. Where in the event that you can't give me scripture, well, tell me what he did for you then. If you can't quote something in the book, tell me something about Devar. Tell me about Peggy. Tell me what happened when you called on Jesus. My God, from sinking sand, he lifted me with tender hand. He lifted me from shades of night to plains of light. Y'all don't go to old school church. Oh, praise his name. He lifted me. You should have something. I was sinking deep in sin. Ah, y'all know that? from a peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sink into right. But the master, 
of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters lifted me now safe. Um, then you move into being an evangelist and says, souls in danger, look above. Jesus completely saved. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea. Billows his will obey. He your savior want to be. So be saved today, love. You should at least know that. Not the song, but the experience. Say amen to that. All right, so you got to know Jesus, and Jesus must be in your mind. It, it cannot be up for discussion. He is the Son of God. And without him, I wouldn't be saved. Without him, I don't have the promise of heaven. All right, just touch your neighbor. Say, neighbor, are you convinced? Are you convinced? I don't neighbor, are you convinced about this Jesus stuff? All right, are you that, That's the question, now, are you convinced? Number two, let's go number two. Ready, read. This is very important because we, I used to teach this too. I used to talk about your priorities. I, used to, I, I, I love to do it during premarital counseling and sometimes postmarital counseling um, to understand priorities. And I would say your problem is your priorities are not in order. Number one should be God. And number two should be your family. Your wife and children. Number three should be this, and number four should be that. And then I got smart, and I changed it, and I says, number one supposed to be God, number two supposed to be your spouse, and number three, your children. And I would teach that. That's pretty good, and it was a really good teaching, because some of us believe that our children come before our spouse, not realizing that them jokers soon leave. Are you, gonna, oh, you, you, you got that. You get that spouse till death do you part. And if you neglect that spouse for them children, when them children are gone, you go one death do you part. So it just makes sense for you to make sure to do that in order. But as I matured, the more Peggy, I realized that that whole situation, that whole scenario is wrong because there's nothing on this planet, nothing that exists that can make a list with God. Let me say it again. There is nothing that can make a list with God. Because when you say Jesus is one and this is two, you're saying that in this regard, this has some of the Jesus skills, the Jesus um, um, criteria and the Jesus characteristics, but Jesus got a little more. So Jesus first and they second. You know what I'm saying? Because when you, when you make a list, you said, okay, here, here are the previous women in life. This one first, that one second. You're saying this one third. So this one, all them pretty, right? But this one more prettier than that one, and that one more pretty. You thought you thought I was gonna call names just now? You don't think I know better than that? Come on, man. I've been doing this long. I call nobody name. You're saying that, that there is some common thread between all of them, and this one edges out the other. That's what you say when you make a list. Now, what list are you gonna put Jesus on? Who, what? has a thread that is common with Jesus. Only one list Jesus can make. That's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Outside of that, you can't put him in the water. Less, who are you going to compare him to? So we move then, that's the thought of this declaration, it's kind of small, that we move from the thought that Jesus is first, and now we make Jesus center. How we do it? He is no longer first in our lives. He is center in our life. Now, Jesus being first is dangerous anyway because when you get to number 14, you can forget what was first. So you can still be in trouble anyway, so you might as well go to the point where he's at the center of this, this circle and everything now, come on, Israel, everything revolves around him. That's the concept um, that we should be adapting, and that's what this, this declaration says, that Jesus has to be center Everything in your life must revolve around him. Now, let me say something that can hurt your feelings. When Jesus becomes center, Brother Monroe, there are no other priorities. One more time. When Jesus is center, there are no other priorities. Because when Jesus is center, this is going to make some of y'all mad, but he may tell you, you know what? Um, I need you to leave your husband and your wife tonight husband or your wife tonight, or leave your children tonight, and I need you to commit this night to prayer. 
or I need you to go over there and preach um, to one revival or one crusade. Now, if you have a list that says God is first and then your children and then your spouse, you can tell God, no, I can't do that. Or there will be times when God says, I need you to go by the office. When God says, I need you to go to the office, and you say, I can't do that because I'm home with my family. Are you following this? When God is first, he got the right to turn things upside down. Okay. That's all together, everybody just say amen. It's going to taste bad, but when you give your life to God, you give him permission to twist the priorities any way he wants them to twist. And he could call you out of your house late at night. Or he can call you off your job to go to your friend. Because friends are supposed to come after work. But because he is God, he can change those priorities however he wants. And that's why you've got to make him center. And once Jesus is center, everything else is up for debate. Let me just put it as a caveat, since I have a lot of younger folks here. That's why you want to marry somebody who loves Jesus too. So when you say, I heard God say so and so, they will say amen. As opposed to telling you, I is the man in this house. And I say, you can't go. <laughs> I won't strike a note. <laughs> <laughs> you want to make sure you connect with somebody, and then we go further. You want to connect. Let me. See, oh God, I want to do relationship talk today. You want to connect with somebody that not only loves God as you love God, but someone whose whose assignment complements yours. You need. There must be some degree of congruence in assignment. Not the same, but they got to be congruent. They can't be fighting one another. That's going to be a problem. That's going to be a serious problem. I almost, I almost like realized, you know what? I can gotta, I can, I gotta call this weird off of me and Robin. I gotta call this off. Let me tell you why? Because she didn't like my sax playing. I said, you know what? God, I miss. What do you mean you don't? You mean you don't like it? It's too loud. You know, let's get paid to play this thing. You know how good I am. You made this thing too loud. You just... <laughs> and then she had a child. She had a child. I thought I killed that demon. She had a child, one daughter. And she was like, I, waited, I, waited, I was waiting until she got like round two, a little older, so she could appreciate it. And I played for her. I played for her. And she, ooh, she started hollering and crying. That thing hurt my feelings so much. So now I got a fan in, the, in Denny. Denny said, Daddy, play your sax. I said, the heir to the throne, buddy. <laughs> he could get everything I own. He loved my sax playing. What number are we on? That's it? Number, let's go fast. Number four, ready? Oh, let's go faster. Ready, read. One more time. Ready, read. I had to re do this declaration in a way that it included everybody. So if you're a man, you got to be godly. And if you are not a man or you're not a father, you got to encourage the fathers that you know. Man, be a godly father. I had a point here, but I, I ran out of declarations, and I know if you go over seven declarations, it's a cardinal sin. So I, I stayed at seven, but I was going to create an eighth declaration um, that says that um, encourage the men in your life to be present and not just give presents. Because that's what being a godly father is, that you are present. And so even if you cannot buy the presence, you are present. And that will cover for all kind of gift that you couldn't buy. If you are there, your child would much rather prefer you than that remote control car. 
they would prefer you than the pair of Jordans that you send into them. So it's important that we encourage our men um, to be present, to be godly fathers. Godly fathers train up their children. Godly fathers do not send their children to church with their mothers. Godly fathers bring their children to church. Godly fathers don't allow their children to admire the worship of their pastor. Godly fathers teach their children to worship. You don't, <laughs> if you are saved, beloved, your child's first spiritual father should be you. They should not be drawing all their spirituality from me and you save and in the house. They can be 18, 19, talking about how much they celebrate God for their spiritual father, Bishop Denzel Rule, and they grew up in your house. It's, oh, Denzel, 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 don't do it. Don't do it. Do it. Oh. Oh. Just touch it for a second. I just, get, I just get a little bothered with this spiritual daddy thing that's going on. This can play on TV. This little spiritual daddy thing is a little dangerous again on here. I mean, because like everybody now, I, I, need, I need a daddy. I need a spiritual daddy. Paul says this. Now, you hear now, Paul ain't had no spiritual daddy. Paul was killing Christians. His name was Saul then. He was trying to kill us. And Saul, after he had his Damascus Road experience, if he was in the 21st century, he would have said to Ananias, would you be my daddy? <laughs> if he was in the 21st century, he would have said, some of y'all don't even know the story. Um, remember when he got blind on the road, Damascus Road? The Lord sent him to the house of an old preacher called Ananias. Ananias prayed for him and his eyes were open. If that was us today, we'd be like, I, I never had a spiritual father. Could you be my father? I need a daddy. Guess what Paul did? Paul, after Ananias opened his eyes, Paul went to the wilderness. He went to the wilderness. And he talks about this in Galatians chapter 2, I believe. He says, I did not confer with man, but I went and sought God for myself. I went to establish a line of communication with God for myself because there's going to be a time when I can can't find my daddy because my daddy has caller ID, a wife and children. Wife, children. And I may need my daddy because I'm going through hell and I need to talk to my daddy. And so, daddy, but my spiritual daddy failed me. He was not there for me. And, and this is why I, I, don't, I don't know where I am in God because my spiritual daddy. <laughs> Get to know God for yourself. Get to know God for yourself. I understand that the oil flows from the head down. I understand that. I understand that Paul says, the word of God says, that you don't have many fathers. You don't have. You don't have. That I've ordained. There's some people who have been called to birth you into certain places. And let me say this parenthetically, that those persons that have fathers, they have misnamed them and called them fathers when they were really mentors. Mentors are in your life for a season. They are there to get you from here to here and then it's over uh-huh so don't go around making everybody your daddy because see i told somebody the other day don't call me spiritual daddy if i can't tell you shut up y'all ain't say it don't, don't don't make me your don't talk about I your spiritual daddy and i tell you that ain't the man for you and you still marry him That's why I ain't looking for children. 
I ain't looking for none. I ain't want none. Because I know you know, can't handle me to be daddy. You can't handle this. I can, t- I can tell you. You need a daddy who can tell you go brush your teeth again. It smells bad. You need a daddy when you come there. How I look? Change that. You ain't want that. You want a daddy? Matubrukusha, yeah, yeah, yeah. It I release from my life onto yours. Re- <laughs> receive. That's what you want. That's what you want. You don't want someone to say, hey, 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 come here, boy. Man, don't walk like that. Dang, what is this pl- is is this life? <laughs> Who can say, no, that ain't the way man does walk. It, it, you're twisting too much. Straighten it out. Don't bend. No, no, no. Fix your hip. Don't turn your hip from side to side. My hip don't turn. They mad. All them, all them on TV, they mad now. No, you don't walk like that. Well, why can't I walk? Because man don't do that. And when man do that, man is attract some things. So I'm trying to help you to not attract what you cannot handle. So straighten out your walk, son. Son. Since son. Since I is your daddy. I good? Mm-hmm. All right. Should I talk to the ladies who want fathers too? Because they always liking me getting them, getting them brethren who want fathers. But these women who want fathers too? No, no baby. No baby. No baby. Your shape don't fit that outfit. No, see, that's what I tell Anaya. That's what I tell Anaya, because she's my daughter, and my job is to cover and protect her. Daddy, what you think? No, sir. What? No. Okay, I could just put, no. No, go back in the room. No. Because I'm trying to be nice to tell you, but I can wrap some of my ways. Listen to me. I said no. Hmm. I almost called somebody name. Some one of my one one would be my I got a lot of gifted people in this church. They gifted they sing and do poet do poetry and they rap and think and do all kind of things. And uh, and they want they want me. They want me be daddy. Um, um Pastor, just let you know. Um, I got invited here, and, and I feel, we feel the Lord saying, "Go there." No, you can't go. No, but I was praying, but and I really feel like I have something to give. No, you can't go. Now, all of a sudden, now you want daddy no more. No, you can't go. I, I know. So you telling me don't go? You, you can't hey, I said don't go. You don't gotta repeat me. I just tell you don't go. I am telling you don't go. But what if I go? Then you are not under my blessing. So figure what you under. I'm not blessing you. Now if you don't value me blessing you, then go. I tell you one thing, in the natural, it would have been a serious problem. I still would have done it, but if he didn't bless me in marrying her, that would have been a problem for me. Because it's rough when you, don't, when you don't have the blessing of the Father. That's why, come on, Denzel, that's why in Matthew chapter 3, before Jesus did any ministry, the Father blessed him. 
Yes, he did. The Bible says the heavens open. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. It's nothing like the blessing of the father. And so even Jesus did not launch in ministry without the father's release. So all of y'all who calling me your daddy, just call me pastor. You could even call me Mr. Rose. You could, say, you could call me Mr. Rose. Because you really don't want to be fathered. I looked at how Naomi was the mother of Ruth, and Naomi gets back home, and Ruth's standing right here. And they said, Ruth, what happened? Naomi, what happened? She says, I went back full. Now, now, now Ruth's standing right here. I went back full. And I came back empty. I mean, Ruth standing right here. And she say, um, in other words, she called Ruth nothing. And guess what Ruth said? Where you go, I go. Where you sleep, I go sleep. Your God gonna be my God. Watch this. When you truly have a spiritual parent, there is nothing they say that hurts you that will leave your mouth to anybody else. Don't clap too fast. When you have a spiritual parent, could you imagine if she hears, if she hears that when she disciplined Anaya, Anaya go and tell Miss Kiaz. Could you imagine how the next seven days will look for Anaya? If she go tell one of y'all, Mummy, round me and beat me. And she find that out. Y'all gonna have to take Anaya in. <laughs> Anaya gonna be homeless. You no, know, you don't talk. You don't talk when your parent corrects you. This can't have you. Where you, where you going? I leave in that church. What? You leaving because the person who you made your parent tells you about your mm-hmm, and now you leaving? I meant when I say mm, I mean your sanctified self. So what I'm saying to you, I'm, I'm in the cases where. Oh. What was the declaration? Put the thing back on the screen, child. Let me see the thing. Let's move on. <sighs> Trying to think. What, what, what it was? I will challenge the mayor to function as godly fathers. So, be careful. Watch this before you assign somebody fatherhood. Be careful before you assign somebody as your father. Be very careful. I have never invited a soul in this church to be my child. Never, never, no one, no one. I think the person who's been with me the longest in this church is probably her. You know, not from a spiritual father-son kind of thing, but she's been with me the longest from the quiet days of back then. And don't call me daddy. Don't do that. Mm -mm. I know Alfred. You know your daddy. Be careful. Don't, don't, don't put me there. Because if you put me there, you got to get what goes along with that. <laughs> guy came to me. He says, um, I, I am no longer under that man of God. I said, what man of God? That man of God there. I said, you mean the one you call your father? Yeah. He ain't my father no more. Why you change daddy? <laughs> what, what happened, buddy? What, what, what's going on? <laughs> you, you see what I'm talking about? That's why they, they, they can't be my children. Because my children ain't gonna walk in the middle while I preach and just walk up and, have, and talk to another one of my children while I talking. I have no children here. 
I can't have no children. Lord Jesus. When I was when I was on, what I say this now? Going to four. Oh, you can't change daddy. I can change children though. <laughs> you can't, you can't, you can't change your daddy. You know, yeah, you're saying that what happened is he has a calling and looks like the pastor, and his his spiritual father said no. So he leaving his father. I said, well, bro, then that's not your father. You made the wrong person your father. Or you out of order. One got to be true. Because if that person is your father and they say no and they are your spiritual father, you got to acquiesce to them. Because it is according to the scriptural principle that the oil runs from them down to you. Now, they may not be your father. They may just be a mentor. But you so hard up for father, you made them father. Are you hearing the full picture of it? Are you getting it? So I'm saying that you may be right in that that person gave you the wrong advice, but you were wrong by making them father. And the last I checked, children don't tell the father, use my daddy. The last time I checked. The last time I checked, it is daddy that confirmed, you're my son. Chapter oh, 4, let me stop. I was talking to found a pastor the other day, and I said to them, um, I said, you know what? I said, with the greatest respect, this is somebody who's senior to me. I said, with the greatest respect to you, and I honor you, but you have misclassified someone as your father because you carry none of their traits. You have none of their DNA. And so now you're in an awkward place where you don't want to go to them about something you had to do because you know they're not going to agree. And the reason they don't agree because y'all don't share the same DNA. But you made them your father, so now you're in a quandary. So I say this to all of you, those of you um, that are in this house, man, assigning spiritual parentage is a major move. It is very critical. And, and that's why Paul says you don't have many fathers. So in other words, you can get me in and out of people. I was talking about my daddy. So be sober, be prayerful, ensure, and until you know, allow them to mentor you, to coach you. How many of you ever met Bradley Cooper? All right, that's three hands going up. He could not have been made my father. He was just my coach. And that's why y'all don't know him. Because you don't have to know my coach. He was in for a season, then he was gone. He coached me. And ain't none of y'all know him, but y'all see me twice a week. Because his role was just in that area, discuss. See, when you, when you, oh God, let me stop this right here. When you adapt somebody, not adopt, but you adapt, you put somebody there's father, you are allowing everything that is them to flow to you. Everything that is them can flow to you. Everything. So this person came to me and said, I want you to father me in the supernatural. I can't father you in the supernatural. And number one, I ain't got no supernatural to give you. But I can't father you. I can give you some direction and some coaching as to how I develop my walk in the supernatural. But don't say father. I can mentor you. I can give you some pointers. Is this too much? Is it necessary? I, 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 I really believe it is in this 21st century church culture that we're in that we need to put some order to this thing and we need to become more sober. Move on. What number are we on? We're getting on four. No more elaboration. Number four, I even need to turn around. Number four, ready, read. That there? I thought I cut that. Go down five. I will not lose my passion for the presence of God. Self-explanatory. Number six. 
This is big. I will not hide my areas of weakness from Jesus. My God, I understand you can't tell church people because they is taught. I understand that. You can't tell church people who everything is going wrong in your life, they is taught. You can't tell your girlfriend what, what, what's going on in your marriage because they can teeth your man. Oh, y'all, y'all didn't know that? Don't tell me y'all didn't know that. Come on, come on. You had to know that. Y'all need a part of a truth. <laughs> yeah. So you don't, you don't, um, you don't, you don't do that. Uh, but for God's sake, tell Jesus. Be open to Jesus about what you're struggling with. Be transparent with Him. You can't cover up to Him. Don't go to Jesus and pray like you some deep prayer warrior when you know you are a fornicator. Don't, don't, don't do that. Pray like a fornicator. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I just went along with it. You know? <laughs> They'd be like, how fornicators pray? <laughs> this is how you go in here. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of... No, I mean, that was, that was funny, but that is true, you know. We have to be transparent before God. We have, watch this, watch this. You know what? Thank you, Holy Spirit. That wasn't off. That was on. Because the, your Bible says, Jesus says, I prefer the publican. Who says, this is me, a sinner. As opposed to the Pharisee who came, like, thank God I ain't like that man over there because I just live right, I just this and the other. That prideful, arrogant, pretentious posture as opposed to one of humility that says, I have this area of weakness in my life. I love you, God, but I'm weak right here. He says, that's the one I want. Not the one who pretends as though they got it all together. What number we on? Seven, last one. Thank you, Lord. Number seven, ready, read. Sorry. Read that one again. Ready? Read. I want you to read it again until it convicts you. Ready? Read. What's your power meter reading? How does your power level work? Now I'm ending. This is number seven here. And how much time do I have left? Okay, I got about ten minutes left. Um, that. The story last week that we talked about in Matthew 17, I believe it was, was when the man was up on the mount, when Jesus was on the mountain with the disciples, and uh, a man brought his son to his disciples, and his son, his disciples couldn't heal him, couldn't deliver him. And um, I want to hitchhike right here, this last point, into today's lesson, and I'm going to bring it to you really quickly. I apologize for spending that much time on the declarations, but we needed to fix that father thing up. So I don't apologize. We need to get that thing straight so we can understand. Now let me, you know what? Please allow me to go back to the Father thing one more time. I really believe that God's order for those of us to grow in God and to mature and to get our place in God is to have father-son relationships. I really believe that. But I believe it has been, it has been taught incompletely. We've not gotten the full picture. I believe the divine order is for father-son relationships in the body of Christ. Daughter-father relationships, even daughter-mother relationships. I believe God has ordained it to be that way, but it must be understood before it can be enacted. Does it make sense? It must be appreciated. We must understand because there was a, a Paul to a Timothy, an Elijah to an Elisha, a Moses to a Joshua. A Jesus to the 12. That, that is divine order. I believe it's designed to work that way. However, there must be a revelation and an understanding of that procedure before it can work out. It is critical for there to be sons and daughters here at life. If we don't, when life, when Denzel dies, life dies. And life was not intended to be a creation of Denzel. It was intended to be a move of God in the earth. And so if we don't fix this and reconcile this whole idea um, of fathers and sons and fathers and daughters, then this can die in this generation. And God is not the God just of Abraham. That's why your Bible says he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God intends for continuity throughout generations. 
Make sense? All right, close that bracket. Let's go back to this word now. I got nine minutes left now. Um, one thing more than anything else, Vera, that came upon me so heavy after this Andrew's assignment is the fact that we must have a power-filled church. We cannot, Life Worship Center, with the mandate that God has given us, with the theme that we have for 2019, our theme is this is our year of supernatural increase and expansion for greater kingdom influence. It is happening all around us. We have shouted and celebrated. We took a whole Sunday off to talk about what's happening from a financial, from a job perspective, people getting new jobs, getting increases. And we took a whole Sunday allowing you all to testify about that. But now we're talking about the greater. The greater is that ministry is about to increase and expand. Doors are about to open, um, um, areas are about to open for those of us that are attached to this house, and with that, it is critical that everyone, including the person sitting next to you, is loaded with power. We cannot have an impotent church and with the assignment that God has given us. What God has called us to do is too great for us not to be able to see someone that has leprosy in that day or HIV in this day next to anyone who cannot lay hand on them and believe God's power to heal them. Okay, let me say it again. We all in this house should believe in God's power to heal. Now, I understand this. You may not see the healing every time, but your faith must be at a place where you are convinced, I lay hand on the sick and the sick recover. Your faith must be at a place where you cast out a devil and the devil leaves. Where we are? We all right? Everybody all right? So, I feel this pressure now, this uh, godly pressure to awaken the people of Life Worship Center to walk at a greater level of faith and manifestation. We must walk at a greater level of faith and manifestation. One of the things that got me with the trip to Andres this weekend is the level of expectation. That scared me. There was a level of expectation uh, in some regards that you don't see that often here in Nazo. Persons came with rare diseases saying, heal me. We did an altar call um, um, for salvation. I don't know the number. I didn't count how many young people came up. There were 12 persons between the age of 12 and 16 that came and they were trembling and crying and shaking as they gave their lives to the Lord, were saved on Friday night, the hand of God was upon them. There was this expectation, this hunger from the adults and the children saying, I want more of God. When you go in those kind of environments, when you have that kind of mandate, you cannot be guessing whether God is real or not. You hear what I'm saying, Stax? You hear what I'm saying? All of us, you cannot be guessing the power of God. You cannot just go to entertain and show how gifted you are. You must give them something beyond what, you, what, they, what they normally see and what they normally um, um, have. We got to stretch their mind and stretch them to understand that God is who he says he is. That cannot happen, beloved, if we ain't convinced. And so this whole teaching about being a servant to being a guest, to be, sorry, to being a guest, to being a servant, to being a son, is to change our own level of thinking to understand that God has called every one of us to function as Jesus functioned in the earth. This sounds like a repeat of four years ago, but it needs to be repeated because I'm sensing the power level going down. The power level is going down. The worship level is doing okay. The prayer level, you know, is, is... But the power levels, for some reason, we are not believing in the power of God the way we should in this house. And we got to wake this up because it's coming. It is coming. It is coming. What's coming? The demand on the house. Not the demand on Pastor Denzel, the demand on the house. Uh, what, more than ever before, I know now that God is removing Pastor Denzel out of the way. I ain't getting to heaven. Ain't time for me to dead yet. But he is now um, auth authorizing and, and sending those of us out that are not Pastor Denzel, but are attached to this anointing. Now is that time where God is saying, I need not just Rev to be smoking hot. I need the house to be smoking hot. 
I don't just need a ref to lay hands. I need the house to lay hands. We talked about this four years ago. It is upon us now. It is upon us now. I was there, and, and I'm talking to life because this life here. Uh, I was there in, 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 in Andrus, and I'm now seeking God. God, who are we going to send to lead this church? That's what I'm thinking now. Who's going to be the 10 that we can send down once a month? And when they go down there, they're going to they gonna function with the weight of life worship center. That, that's what my thought is. My thought is, boy, Denzel, you need to make space. I don't have the space. I can't do it. But God says it's time now. And I'm saying to those of you, please don't believe if you joined this church three weeks ago or some of you joined in come Friday at our new members retreat that you ain't included in this. Everyone attached to this house, you are included in this. Everyone. If you are a visitor here today who can join tomorrow, you are included in this. That God says the power is not for the pulpit. The power is for the house. Everyone in this house must believe. Y'all ain't responding right. Everyone in this house must believe in the hand, the power, the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a reason, beloved, there is a reason that we pulled back on laying all the hands we were laying. Not because I was tired, not because the church grew, but because it was time for us to grow up. I, I shared this with Mopi over there in, in Andrus. I can lay hands in life every single service and the anointing will flow every service. Why? Because the atmosphere here is charged. There's a worship environment. And so if I don't lay hand, it is not quenching the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is just always here. It is always here and we can always move and lay hands. I'll prove it to y'all, but I can do it. I can stop right now preaching and lay hands on five of y'all and some of y'all can get healed and get delivered. That anointing is always here. But if we continue to do that, we will develop a church filled with dungrows. Midgets spiritually, babies spiritually, who are saying, pray for me, pastor. And what happens in that instance is when the pastor got to go somewhere, I got to do some ministry, there's no power in the church. Because Reverend lay hands. Some people came to me and said, boy, pastor, you ain't lay hands in a long time. I said, I know. I ain't forget. You, you forget how to lay hands? No, I know how to do it. I ain't forget how to do it. Pastor, what happened? You and me feeling that anointing me. My hand on fire every Sunday morning. It is right now. It's on fire every single Sunday morning. There's not a Sunday that I come here and I don't feel the fire go to my left hand. Not a Sunday, not one, not one. Not a Tuesday, not one, not a single one. It is here every time. Well, Pastor, you quenching the move of God. No, I'm growing a people. I am growing a people, and we will not have you sitting down waiting for an aspirin every Sunday, waiting on a handout every Sunday. We got to grow up in God that you get to the place where you lay your hand on yourself and declare, I am healed in Jesus' name. I curse you, headed to go back to the pits of hell. My mind is regulated. That is what we're trying to develop here, not a place where I can't wait to get to church because pastor can pray for me. No, man. Well, I can't wait to get here to empower you to go out. I'm in to get it to show you how powerful I am. If you get in and say, man, I get in this. So, so this demand is being placed on us. It's being placed on us. And it is, it is for this reason that we were not all excited about making everybody rev and this one, that, that one, that. Because titles just confuse us. When you get on a little title, you think you're special. You feel different, you feel set apart, and you are. You're just now a greater servant. That's what, you know how you're supposed to identify the ministers? By those who serve in the most. Hmm. The truth is, someone should visit this church and be able to tell you who the ministers are. And they shouldn't be wearing no collars. But just watch how they serve. Uh-oh. I wonder if I gave out a survey and asked people to tell me who you think the ministers are. I wonder whose name they put on the list. Ministers. I wonder who they would guess. Okay, these are the ones who are about to be ministers. Mm. In the words of Rodney Monker. That's, that's powerful. So then, I'm closing now. I'm closing now. Here we go. 
I'm closing. Watch this to me. Um, man, I have four good points. I can throw it at you and I can preach it at you next week. The first thing is, this text, let me set up the little pericope here now. This text, uh, Jesus um, has just done preaching the very, uh, um, that sermon that we all know and celebrate, we call it the Sermon on the Mount. That is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. You all with me? 5, 6, and 7. That, um, the Beatitudes begins that teaching, and he goes on several different areas. He talks about, uh, in chapter 6, he talks about money and seeking first the kingdom of God and where your treasures, there will your heart be. Chapter 7, he talks more about your lifestyle a little bit. Of course, chapter 5 was the Beatitudes. And he's ending now in chapter 7 his teaching on the Mount, powerful teaching. The Bible says multitudes, plenty people are surrounding him, people from all over. They are surrounding him, a major operation going on. This is a major crusade he had on top of this hill, sitting down. That's amazing that he preached this big sermon sitting down on a rock. He sat, he, he, the Bible says he got him gathered and he sat down and began teaching. Big crusade. He teaches sitting down. Wonder where we get all this hollering and, and, and squalling from. Then Jesus used to just teach. Oh, that preacher ain't anointed because they, 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 they ain't anointed. They ain't powerful. I need a power. A preacher called me this morning. He said, I want to bring this person in to preach. Are they a revival preacher? I got a call this morning. I said, what do you mean a revival preacher? You know, I don't know they, they hot, man. I said, no, they ain't hot, but they'll change your mind. Because they'll bring deep revelation. So if you want to just shout, don't call them. But if you want real change, call them. Okay, well, I, I know we're ready for that. I said, whoosh, kata. Uh-huh. Yeah, glory to God. So, so uh, Jesus sits down for three chapters and he teaches. And now we in chapter eight. I wish, I wish I had more time, boy, because this can get good. Because it made me shout when I was reading it. Because uh, I'm ready for point number one. Here it is now. So Jesus is now teaching on that mountain top. Someone say on the mountain top. He is teaching on the mountain top. So you got the mountain top and you got Jesus. That's like a double man. You got mountaintop and Jesus, and now Jesus, Yasmin, is on his way down the mountain, and the leper meets him. And God says, point number one, tell them this, that let them know that even though they miss the mountain, they ain't too late. Some people will make you feel like you miss your moment. That you miss that window that you had to be blessed. And you sometimes would disqualify yourself because of all the stuff you did wrong and you didn't show up when you're supposed to show up. You weren't there when you should have been there. When you should have been living holy, you was living unrighteous. When you should have been doing that, you was doing the other. And now you think you didn't miss the window and it's too late. But I'm here to let you know that even if you like this leper who was on his way to the mountain but didn't make it to the mountain, that you could still meet Jesus on the way down. Glory to God. That Jesus loved this thing, blessed me so much that even if you miss the mountaintop, you can still catch Jesus. Some of you are missing Jesus because you missed the mountain. That's all right. When you got Jesus, he'll take you to another mountain. Don't worry about the fact that everybody else was there to get it, and by now, all your friends have been married and you were married. All your friends have got their own business and you're still working for somebody. You ain't got no job. You this and that and the other, but God says, let you know you ain't too late. You are not too late. Don't you allow yourself to qualify yourself because there's no condition on the planet that's authorized to disqualify you. The only person that can disqualify you is you. Your sin even ain't strong enough to disqualify you. Your mess up is not qualified to disqualify you. You are the only person. And so here is this leper. He missed the mountaintop, but he still caught Jesus. And so he runs into Jesus. Now, this number two, this is a big deal now. Number two, I ain't going to hit this hard because we got to go home, is that you cannot allow the crowd to determine what you get from God. Because, watch this, watch this, watch this. The crowd shows up, and the crowd knows he is a leper. And he knows that if the crowd sees him approaching Jesus being a leper, glory to God, the crowd could stone him. The crowd could get rid of him because lepers ain't supposed to mix with people. 
people. But there comes a point in all of our life when we get sick or tired of being sick and tired, and we say, forget the rules. I almost said to hell with the rules, but to hell in a nice thing to say. We say, forget the rules. Mm -hmm. You can figure out the rest. I, I need to get to God, and I don't care what the rules say. I don't care what the procedure is. I don't care what the structure is. There comes a point in time where you got to say, I got to get it now. And, and, and even that clap confirms that many of us are just too passive. Many of us are just too laid back. And that mentality where you waiting, because guess what? If 10 more people to clap, you would clap just now. The day is over for that foolishness. You got to say, you know what? I getting what I getting. I get for what I need. I don't need no one to agree with me. I don't need no one to go with me. I got to get what God has for me. This, this got to be... Every now and then, you need a me moment. Every now and then, you, you need to get to the place where I don't care who agrees or who disagrees. I don't care who say amen or who say who don't say amen. I don't care who think I'm worthy. You can talk about me. You know what? I, I've been saying this to some church people. Tens of, mm, got to go. That you, I, I'm tired of people telling, coming to me, telling me in these meetings and these council sessions, people don't like me. So what? Please stop wasting precious counseling time with Pastor Denzel to come and tell me people don't like me. And? That's an announcement? You, 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 come, you come do a whole meeting, way show the street to let me know people don't like you. Let me help you, everyone. Look at me. Look at me. People don't like you. Write it down. Put it in your notes. People don't like you. But guess what? You don't like people. Why are you carrying this though? That's some kind of strange thing. When you don't like people yourself. Because somebody got a meeting with me tomorrow on you. You think only you want one meeting? No, some people can't stand you either. They think your way is bad. They, they, they don't, they don't, they only hail you because they see me looking. I, I say, sometimes I was going to record meetings and then when people come, let me play this, let me have a day with you. Man, Pastor, that person's there, listen to me, they got to change their ways and this and that. And then you go to the next meeting, Pastor, my people over there, wait, they got to change their ways and this and that. And I, I said, I say, yeah, I see, yeah, they really, yeah, I, I understand. Pastor, you want to say nothing? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. I can, I can leave that alone. Uh, and and I, I really be struggling to be like, God, please give me the words to say so I don't say bad things to people. Because I just be on the verge of saying bad things. Because at some point, you got to grow up. Everybody in in your fan club, and that's fine. And Because God don't ask their permission to bless you. Yeah. When God decides to bless me, he don't ask if you all think he should. So we say, why would you all approve no man is. I was talking. I shouldn't. No, I shouldn't say this. Okay, close back. No, I can't say that. That's a, that's a bad thing because we. The, 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 I can't let go on TV. Um, to, like when we finish, I can say it. So you got to get to the place where, like this leper, you got to say, you know what? If they throw me out, they throw me out. I gotta get from. I gotta get from God. I made this point last week Sunday afternoon. See, let's start playing. It's time to go. Last week Sunday afternoon, I said that we need to. Not like that. Uh, 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 you trying to end me for truth? Stop playing. Uh, <laughs> He's like, Rev, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> I said last week that a renewed mind means becoming like a baby. I like babies. See that baby who said this now? When babies um, need something, they don't care where it is. You put them in the middle of a courtroom where the judge says, um, um, order in the court, and they feel like they're hungry, they will holler right in there, and they don't care. We could be in a moment of silence. Now may their souls rest in peace. Now we pause for a moment of silence. I like babies. Babies don't care. And God says we need a renewed mind. We need to get back to baby state. Where when we got a need, when we need God to come through, we don't care what the protocol is. We don't care what's happening. We holler. I'm almost finished. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Talk fast. Talk fast, Denzel. The next point is, don't talk fast. All right. Talk hurry. Uh, the next thing is, he, he, he ran to his feet and worshiped. I ain't got time for that. Here's the point. I'm going to go to the last one. He goes to God, like all of us. Now you can play this off again. 
I can wait on you. There it is. He says something that we all say. He says, God, you're able. He says, God, you're able. But I am sure that you will. This is the testimony of the typical guest. We know his ability, but we stay outside of his will. We question his will. He says, God, you're able. I know you can eat my leprosy. But I'm sure if you will do it. This, this, this is all of it here. This is the whole thing. The whole point of the matter is this. As we move to this place that God is calling us to, life, we cannot question the will of God. We cannot be another set of church people who shout over God being able. I got so sick of that my entire church life. I, tired, I got tired of that. That every Sunday after Sunday, we just shout about what God is able to do. I remember this when I went to St. Andrews on scholarship, Sonia. When I went to St. Andrews on scholarship and I got home to Devon and Dwayne and Delton, boy, I was bragging, boy, Peggy. I was bragging. I said to them, I said, boy, listen, I go into school with all the rich people. I say, man, all the rich people, the people them, the Pinders them, the Sawyers them, the Roberts them. I said, man, Hubert Ingram churn in my class, man. Not in my classes, I did younger than me. They in my school, Hubert Ingram churn them there. And all the little politicians churn there. Man, all the money in Nassau, I in school with all them sitting in the same class, breathing the same air, going to lunchtime with them in the pool. I can't swim like them, but I in the pool all the same. I doggy battling. We in the pool and we doing our thing. And I, I with the big timers, Devin said something I'll never get. He said, how much money they give you? They haven't crushed my life. He say, how much money they give you? I spent three years in St. Andrews with all them rich people. Them jokes, they never buy me lunch. All that money they had, I ain't get a lunch off of them. That's the typical believer. Bragging about how powerful God is. You tell me the believer Jaquay is saying, he woke me up this morning, started me on my way, put shoes on my feet, clothes on my back. That's what believers celebrate? Or oh, y'all don't like this? Hold on, hold on. You save and your celebration is, he woke me up this morning, started me on my way, he put shoes on my feet, clothes, clothes, clothes. Clothes on my back. When I opened the cupboard, there was food to eat. Yes, Lord. God, oh God, he is able. Look at me. I'm a testimony. Didn't make it on my own. I'm not standing here. You guys slow down. All alone. It was Jesus. Oh Lord, it was Jesus. It was Jesus. Oh Lord, touch your neighbor and say he's able. He's able. Oh. That felt good, boy. Oh. <laughs> but guess what, boy? Hold on, hold on, Sila. The dude who's smoking weed this morning got all them. Hold on, Sila. I want to hear me good. The dude who was partying and boys one boy with one Hennekin bottle last night. This morning, he could say all those things you said. Because God woke him up this morning, started him on his way, gave him enough money to get three for five. Senior man, 
Everything that we shout about, senior man got all of them. And we bragging. God. What? That's, that's God being able? So what I say it for? What am I saying for if that's the ability of God? That's what, that's what serving God does. He's put clothes on your back. Shoes on your feet. That's it? Is that it? Uh, well, the Lord says, he says, that leper offended me. I don't know if you will, but I know you can. The believer must live in the place of the will of God, where I know God will. I know I am giving you permission to move out of the can of God and step into the will of God. Know that God will. I am not guessing. Do you get it? All that talking this morning. Do you get it? That we're moving to the will of God. I don't know the will. Yes, you do. That you prosper and be in good health even as your soul prosper. I don't know the will. I came that you may have a life and have it. I don't know the will. Yea, in all these things, I am more than a conqueror. What do you mean you don't know the will? You know the will. You just stay in the can. There ought to be, play now, Sila, for the last time. One of the meanings of, he's scared now. One of the meanings of the word bless, Damien, don't miss this. One of the meanings of the word bless, write this down. It means to be envied. Denzel, that was good just now. One of the meanings of the word bless, if you get an amplified Bible, check it out. Go find bless and you will see one of the things in brackets says to be envied. To be envied. If they have shoes and you have shoes, they have food, you have food. They woke up, you woke up. What is there to envy? You know what's happening? If this is true, unbelievers are more blessed than believers because we envy in them more than they envy in us. We envy in Sabas more than they envy in us. I ain't dogging Sabas. God bless him. <laughs> he's enviable. <laughs> that, joke, that joker is enviable. Why are we not being envied? Can't why nobody won't be like us? Why nobody look at us and say, boy, you know what, boy, life ain't fair. But look, 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 come on, man, look at it going on. They say the same thing, but a different way. Ah, oh, Lord, life ain't fair. They pitying us. We speaking in tongues, rolling on the floor, spitting and snorting and foaming, and they saying, "Ah, oh, Lord, Re Rev, you need something." People blessing us out of pity. Oh, this dude says, "God, you will." I mean, you can, but I ain't sure you will. Not in this church. We're moving to the will of God. We're moving to the will. We know that he will. This was long. I hope it was strong. I hope it was good. It, were you blessed today by this word? Come on, clap your hands if you were. He says the final point is this. The only place to move to the will of God, every head is probably eyes closed. And I was, I was looking, um, Marisha, for some deep points on this. He says, to move to this place of knowing that God will, it requires a posture of prayer. I said, God, that's it? He said, yep, that's it. You don't know my will because you don't know me. You don't know me because you ain't praying enough. I was, I was getting dressed this morning. And I was thinking to myself that I don't fear a thing 
once I have time to pray before I do it. I ain't gonna lie to you. The only time your pastor panics is when he didn't have prayer time. Prayer time ain't me talking to God. Prayer time is me encountering God. I believe I can handle anything. Just give me a moment. Let me get, let me get in prayer. Just give me a moment. Just let me, just let me get in prayer. And I'm praying that you hear this as an invitation to go deeper in prayer so that you will not guess the will of God. I was long this morning. Boy, I hope you got this. I hope you got this. Come on, Celo. I pray now, Father, that this word fell on good ground. And it brings forth fruit. And fruit that will remain. I thank you. I bless you. Thank you, I bless you. Mm -hmm. God, I praise you. I praise you that these people are about to walk into their immediately. Their cleansing, their shifting, their transition is about to happen immediately. If you receive from God today, clap your hands and give him thanks, everybody. Come on.